بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته نمبر 5 so الله سبحانه وتعالى says قال يا بني لا تقصص رؤياك على اخوتك فيكيدوا لك كيدا ان الشيطان للانسان عدو مبين so yusuf عليه الصلاه والسلام he sees this wonderful dream of the sun, the moon, and the stars. We call them the celestial objects, if you want to push for it. They are celestial objects that Allah has placed in the heavens, and they are filled with meaning and metaphors. So if you think about, uh, one of the things I was reflecting when I was looking at the heavens, is that if you think about the sun and the moon and the stars, they have a pattern. You can predict their pattern. So he, you know where the sun's going to be, you know where the moon's going to be, you know where the stars are, and now you know even when you're looking for the Ramadan, the Eid, uh, you know roughly through technology, roughly where the sun, where the moon is going to be. We went to look for the moon. We knew roughly where to look in that area. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered the universe. And there's a meaning in that, that they don't deviate from what Allah has created for them. Hmm? So when you look at the cosmos, these inanimate objects, these objects that don't have aql, but Allah has placed them in the universe and they follow a pattern. And we've been looking at that pattern for billions of years. Isn't that amazing that they've been following a predictable pattern? We know when to predict the next eclipse now. We know when this star is going to be where. All of these things. And not so long ago, the farmers would know, for example, when to uh, plant in the ocean on a ship. How would you know where you are? You look at the stars. If a pilot, if his, if his navigation system broke down, he could probably look at the stars and work out where, where they are. And of course, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi talked about the Sahaba. And what did he say? They are like? Stars, right? In other words, you are navigated by them. So there's lots of meaning in the moon and the stars and these sort of things. That unfortunately, because of light pollution and where we live, we don't see them. But there's lots of meaning Allah has placed in them. Anyway, Yusuf والسلام, comes to his father and says, Ya, uh, my father, I have seen this dream. The first thing his father says to him, Ya Bunayya, what a beautiful way to address someone. Oh, my beloved son. Oh, my dear son. You know why he said this? Because he wanted to bring him close to him. He said, my dear son, I'm going to tell you something very, very important. And I want you to listen very, very carefully. He never said to him, oh son, he said, Ya Bunayya. Oh my dear son, La taqsus ru'yaka. Don't tell anyone about your dream. La taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatika. Don't tell your vision that you saw this dream to your brothers. Perhaps because if they hear about it, they might be able to interpret the dream. And therefore, something bad might happen to you. So what does he say? La bunayya la taqsus ru'yaka ala ikhwatika fayakidu laka kaira. And they will plot against you. To plot against you? Inna shaytana lil insani aduwum mubeen. But ultimately, he also recognizes that the shaytan is your open enemy. So there's a lot to unpack here in this one particular verse. So first of all, the Prophet Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, saw these celestial objects in his dream. His father, out of love and concern, addresses his son by saying, Ya Bunayya, to put him at ease. Because Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, is a young child. When someone's very young, they don't understand how the world works. They don't understand siyasat. You know siyasat means politics. You know elders, they play politics, right? As you get older, people play politics amongst themselves. A child is naive. A child is naive. And sometimes, sadly, elders take advantage of children. Sometimes teachers take advantage of their students for their own political gains. The student thinks, this is my sheikh, I must do whatever he tells me to do. But sometimes, unfortunately, even teachers have been known to take advantage of their students because they want to please their student, they want, they want to please their sheikh, or they want to, place, they want to place, please their peers. We're all guilty of this. When we're young, we think we know better. So he's saying to him, I'm telling you something, Ya Bunayya. So he's bringing him close to him. This also teaches us when something is a serious matter, you don't need to panic. Right? Because when you panic, the person you're talking to, he begins to panic. In other words, be calm. Because Yaqub had Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he believed that whatever was meant to happen now is by the qad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why your good leaders are the ones who are calm, even when things get really, really difficult. And if you think about people who become captains or run ships or get into battles, they're very calm people because you need level-headed people. 
to do that. So it says, Ya Bunaya, la taqsusru yaka ala ikhwatika. Don't divulge. Don't tell your brothers what you saw. Because it appears from the context of the verse that they would be able to interpret the deen. And immediately they would become jealous of Yusuf alayhi salatu But there's also something very, very fascinating here for my friends. Yaqub alayhi salatu is a great prophet of Allah. But one of the duties of a prophet and who we should follow is that in every event, whatever is going to happen, we try and defuse the situation. We try and protect all parties involved, even the immoral ones, even the evil ones. How? I will show you. So he says to him, don't tell anyone about this dream because they will become jealous. It could only fuel their jealousy and harm Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. Otherwise, why would Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam tell him, don't, don't tell him about your dream. In other words, some harm will come to you, O Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, my son, by you telling people, it's a good dream, wonderful, great for you, wonderful, congratulations. But this dream, you don't tell anyone because they will harm you as well. Now when he said this to him, this wasn't a legal ruling. This is what's usually referred to as a mashwara. So he said, look, it's up to you, but my view is you should probably not tell anyone. Right? Don't tell anyone about this dream. So it wasn't a hukam because sometimes when you go to mashwara, to a sheikh, you have to understand my friends. You go, to a, you go to a sheikh either to get one or two things, usually a fatwa or to get a mashwara. Mashwara is not legally binding. If you go to some big alim and you say to the alim, uh, sheikh, you know, we want your mashwara on this particular thing, you have to first of all in your mind work out, is he giving you a hukam, a legal ruling, or if he's just giving you an opinion. If he's just giving you an opinion on himself, then it's open to interpretation. You don't have to take it. Does that make sense? It's good to ask ulama, it's good to ask pious people, but you might think that you don't need to take it on. But if you ask them a mas'ala, there's a mashwara and a mas'ala. When you ask them a mas'ala, then that's a little bit more important. It might not necessarily be the one you want to follow. You might want to go, go and ask another alim. You might want to ask four or five alims. That's a different matter. But here, Yaqub is giving a mashwara to his son. He's saying, look, if you ask me, this is the best thing for you. Don't tell your brother. Because he's seeing a greater harm that might come to his son Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam. Look at the wisdom of Yaqub, my friends. Look at the wisdom of Yaqub. So far in our minds, we are thinking that he's only protecting his one son or his other son, Bin Yamin, who will come into the story as well. But he's also protecting who else? How is he protecting his other brothers? Please. That's what you said, right? His other brothers. How, how is he protecting his other brothers? Some harm. harm. So they will come to harm. They will get jealous. Mm. So Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam is doing what we should be doing, which is that he's seeing that there's a potential here for conflict. Potential here for conflict. It's very, very important, my friends. Very, very important. He's seeing that I'm protecting this party and that party. I'm protecting Yusuf alayhi salam. I'm protecting bin Yamin, but I'm also protecting his other brothers. This is what every prophet does. Every prophet does this. They are not fitna mangaras. They don't want fitna. They don't want people to fight. Because that's not a prophetic way. The ulama and the mashayikh, what do they do? They'll take the burden. The Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, he'll take on the burden. But he never wants harm for the ummah. He never wants the awam. He never wants the sahaba to become embroiled in conflict. You can swear at me. You can insult me. You can say what you want. But what's important is that the brothers work together. This is what we see in the story of Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. It's a beautiful kind of reflection point in this particular story. So even at home, sometimes you come home and it might be that you come home and your one son is tired, another son is tired, and one son says one thing, another says, son says another thing. What you want to do is diffuse the situation. You want to bring calm into the house. What you don't want to do is like, oh, did you hear he said this about you? What do we do? We're gossip mongers. What do we do? Did you hear he said this about you? This is why Allah also says in the same verse, look at what Allah says at the end. What does Allah say at the end? In the same verse. Read it to me, everyone. In the linnasi aduwum mubin. Can you see? Shaitan wants what? He wants you to fight. So this is shaitaniyat. But at the beginning, we're going to be like Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. This is wonderful. Just in this one ayat, we haven't even gone anywhere further. We're still in this first ayat of uh, number five here. 
So he's protecting both parties from harm. This is how a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a sincere owner should behave. To bring people together, protect people and seeking what I would call in English amity. You have a word. Let me teach you some English as well. Enmity. What does enmity mean? The freak. But you also have a similar word in English called amity. Amity means to bring people together. Quran, I will teach you English too. Yani you're not just here in Quran here. You're learning some English too. Right? You learn other things too. So there's enmity and uski zid in grammar is called amity. Allah will also bring amity. What we want is to become, we say in English, amicable. We want an amicable relationship. So it's amity. So this is what Yaqub is teaching us, my friends, as well. So this is important. So the lovers of Allah, let me make it a little bit more clear for you. The lovers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all will spread love among his slaves. The lovers of Allah spread love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among his slaves because Allah wants us to be united. And when we are united, we can attend to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is important. But is it a shaitan in the same verse? It is shaitan who Allah alludes to and Yaqub mentions him and his evil traits that he wants to divide us. So even though shaitan wants to divide us, it's shaitaniyat. It's a devilish trait to divide people. You know, people who spend their time on social media causing division, hatred, people who like to go on social media causing division, rumor mongering, these sort of things. This is shaitan here. This is what shaitan does. What does shaitan do? He goes around and says, Zubair, did you hear? Did you hear about this? He goes to you and says, did you hear this about Zubair? Because what does shaitan want to do? He wants to create fight. That's what he loves. Because then the ummah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, وَلَا تَنَازَعُ فَتَفْشَلُوا Don't fight amongst each other. فَتَفْشَلُوا وَتَذْهَبَ رِيحُكُمْ Beautiful. Because they were sailors. So Allah said, if you start fighting amongst yourselves, you will become groups and Allah will take away the wind from your sails. It's a metaphor. A ship needs to sail. You need to reach your destination. But what happens if the wind is taken away? You can't reach your destination. All the ship, the sailors on the ship, they can argue and fight, right? But what will happen? The ship will be destroyed and they will all be destroyed. They will all be destroyed. That's why you need a leader, a good captain on the ship who can keep the, everything on point. So Allah is mentioning this in the Quran elsewhere as well. So shaitan is an open enemy. Inna shaitan alin nasi aduwum mubeen. Because he wants to plant the seeds of disunity. Now one point in unity. Unity, everybody thinks that unity means we should all agree on the same thing. That's what unity means. Unity means that despite our differences in mizaj, in temperament, on worldview, we still have a goal that unites us. We still work together. Right? People can have differences. It's natural. Allah Ta'ala created. Even the fuqaha have differences. The books of fiqh are filled with differences in many, many masail. Right? Even in our own masajid, we have mazahib that follow Abu Hanifa, all the people that follow Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmad. They're all correct. Yeah? But we all perform the same salah. We all achieve the same goal. So, of course, the decision on what is to be shared from a dream, and this is some nasiha for you, well, any good news depends on the context. Sometimes you might have a good news and you might want to share it with someone. But be careful who you share good news with. You don't need to tweet about it. You don't need to tell everyone about it. People who really care about you and people that need to know, maybe you see a good dream, be careful who you share your dreams with. And dreams can mean literal dream that you saw in, at night, but it also means your ambitions. We all have ambitions. We all want to achieve things in life. But be careful who you share it with because not everybody wants... Good for you. And last time you talked about how sometimes even people who are close to you are the ones who are going to pull you down. Because the brothers of Yusuf والسلام, had plans against him as well. And sometimes good news can also be shared. It might be an inspiration. You might do something good in life and you might want to share it. Not because of pride, but if I do something good, then other youngsters, mashallah, will be inspired by it. So we also need role models in our community. So it's kind of depending on the context as well. And we'll see that ultimately sharing good news or not is decided on what's the overall outcome. We we'll see this in the story of Yusuf والسلام, because you see the wisdom by which Yaqub told him not to tell his brothers about his dream. The next verse. وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِن تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ 
don't worry, the clock time, the timer is on, I'll stop when the time runs out. وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ Allahu Akbar. So Allah chose you, O Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam, وَيُعَلِّمُكَ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ Allah taught you the interpretation of dreams. وَيُتِمَّ نِعْمَتَهُ عَلَيْكَ And He perfected His favor upon you and the descendants of Yaqub, just as he once perfected upon your forefathers, forefathers Ibrahim and Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam, surely Allah is all-knowing and Allah is wise. SubhanAllah. So much to unpack here. Inshallah, I'll go for it now. Fundamental point Allah makes here through Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. Look at the first part of the verse. وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ Thus, your Lord chose you. It's a fundamental Akida point. Point of Kalam or theology, which is that Allah chooses to do whatever He wishes. In your life, in my life, some people Allah will give beauty to. Some people Allah will give wealth to. Some people Allah will give lots of children to. Other people, Allah won't give them that. Allah will give them less of something. I was just, before I came, many, many years ago, I did a nikah. And not here, but somewhere else. The brother was a convert. He married a sister. I did a nikah many, many years ago. And then another brother uh, met him at Lake District. And he said, oh, do you know this brother? He was a convert. He sent me a picture of him. Now, who's going to remember how many nikahs you've done? So anyway, this brother, I saw the picture. I remembered him, mashallah ta'ala. And he was telling me, subhanallah, look how Allah ta'ala plans. He was telling me that the, the family that we met, so both families, both the families that met, the one that did the nikah, one the brother that met him, he's, he's a good friend of mine, they can't have, for one reason or another, they can't have children. So they have adopted children, both families. So the brother that I did the nikah for, the convert, they found out they couldn't have children. So they adopted a child, a Muslim child. They adopted a child and they did tarbi of the child. And then eventually that child went into the hands of this other family who couldn't have children as well. And then they took on some more children. So both of these families met. And they must have mentioned, like one of the families must have mentioned, who did you do, who did you nikah? So he said, oh, there was this person in black. And eventually they realized they both knew each other. The both of them knew me. So he sent me a picture and I was like, subhanAllah, look how Allah's nizam, that Allah wrote for them that they're not going to have biological children, but Allah wrote for them that they're going to adopt children. How many children have been protected? Their iman has been protected. So sometimes you don't have children. What I'm saying is you don't have children, but Allah will give you other children in other means. And that's also a form of sadqa jariya as well. So, وَكَذَلِكَ يَجْتَبِيكَ رَبُّكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you. And this is to teach us that Allah can do what He wishes. And there's no one, no one who has the right to question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one can say to Allah, why did you give him more? Why did you give her more? This is hasad. This is what we will see with the brothers of Yaqub. This haram in the sharia. To be jealous. To have envy towards somebody. Uh, to have spite towards someone because Allah has given them something. Hmm? That's for Allah to give to whoever He wishes. We should be happy with what Allah has given to whomsoever He wishes. And so this is something that He mentions. Even if Allah gives you lots of wealth, that's a test for you. And if Allah gives you a little wealth, that's also a test for you. We are all being tested. We are all being tested. Allah gives you children, that's a test. Allah doesn't give you children, that's a test for you today. That's all a test. All of it is an imtihan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna rabbaka alimun hakim. Look at this. Allah is reminding you. Right at the, at the end. He's using his attributes. He's all-knowing and he's wise. Right? So you might think, why Allah, I haven't got so much money. Why Allah, I haven't got so much wealth and power or influence. It might be good for you that you don't have it. Sometimes you have power and wealth, it's good for you. But Allah is all-knowing and Allah is all-wise. He knows what's good for you. Because He knows what's going to harm you and what's beneficial for you. This comes down to a basic point of having Iman bil Qad. Whatever Allah has written for you, it's good for you. Kullu khay. All of it is good for you. When He takes your life, the life of the loved ones, your parents, your grandparents, we all have to go. That is Allah's right. Allah can take whoever He is. This is why we say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. At that difficult moment, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We belong to Allah and we will return back to Allah. So everything belongs to Him. And Allah is so merciful when, you, when your grandparents or your parents or your loved ones move on, 
you haven't lost them. You haven't lost them. People say like, oh, I'm really sorry for your loss. That's understandable. But you will meet your spouse. You will meet your parents. You will meet your grandparents in Jannah. Insha'Allah ta'ala. And you will be with them for eternity. So this world, you will forget about it as soon as you have returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa just to give you some inspiration, he says that a person who was the most, most miserable person in the dunya, nothing ever went for him. He was the most miserable person in the dunya. He would be taken, he'll just be dipped in Jannah. He'll just be dipped in Jannah. And when I was a child, I used to think like dipping chips, you know, so because I had a wild imagination. So he will be dipped in Jannah and then he'll be asked, did you ever experience difficulty? You know what he'll say? Never. Just a one moment in Jannah, the bliss of Jannah. And then another person will be taken, he had everything in the dunya, and he'll be dipped into Jahannam just for a moment. He'll see what will happen in Jahannam. And he'll be asked, did you ever experience pleasure? He said, no, because it you forget. Yeah, so you, we forget very, very quickly. So it's temporal. This life is temporary for us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen Yusuf alayhi salatu wa to interpret deems and Allah will complete his favors upon him. And likewise, Allah will fa- complete his favors upon us. Whatever is written for us, we have to work and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will favor us insha'Allah ta'ala. Next verse. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفَ وَإِخْوَتِهِ آيَاتُ لِلسَّائِلِينَ Indeed, in the story of Joseph and his brothers, there are lessons for all who ask. Subhanallah. Some people say that some Jews came to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they asked him about this story, so he's responding to this. But another way of thinking about this story is this is where the story really begins. Now the story actually begins. So until now, all the ayat were this introduction. If you're reading a book, we have an introduction. This is the main part of the story. It's very beautiful. I was thinking about this ayat ilin this morning, subhanallah. When Allah says there are lessons for all who ask, Allah is making a very subtle point to me here. That you must be a seeker of truth. You must ask questions. You must be a questioner. Nowadays people say, Malana, don't ask questions, just do things. But Allah is saying what? Does Allah say in the Quran, don't ask? Does Allah say become blind followers in the Quran? No. Did Umar ta'ala become a companion just by becoming blind follower? No, he used the gift that Allah had given to him. You'll find this in the Quran time and time again. So that journey for seeking the truth begins with asking questions. Where does it begin? By asking intelligent questions. Let me put that word in as well. You don't just ask questions for the sake of asking questions, but you become an intelligent person who asks the right type of questions. And when you ask questions, that creates a realization. We should have The questioning comes from a realization from within us that we are indeed ignorant. We are indeed ignorant people and jahil. A person who is arrogant, a person who thinks he knows it all, will never become humble. They'll never know that, you know what, I don't know anything. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plays, says in the Quran, Inna aradna al-amanata ala samawati wal ardi wal jibali fa'abayna an yahmin laha. The, the heavens, Allah presented this trust, this amana to worship Allah in reward they will get Jannah for it. فَأَبَيْنَ أَنْ يَحْمِلْ لَهَا So Allah says that we presented this trust, the heavens, this great creation of samawati wal earth. They felt it was too difficult. وَأَشْفَقَنَ minha. They shirked away from it. وَحَمَلَهَا insan. But insan took it on. And Allah says something very fascinating tied, tied to this. إِنَّهُ كَانَ ذَلُومًا jahula. Man is very, very oppressive and he's just ignorant. In other words, Allah's telling you, you are born in a state of ignorance. You are born in a state of oppression. You're supposed to move away from it. So when Allah says you're in this state, it doesn't mean you stay there. Or Allah ni kaha hai ke, we should be ignorant. We're born ignorant. Allah said that we should be oppressive. No, you should rise from that. You should rise from that and become a better person. So Allah's teaching us here in Surah Yusuf as well. Become from those people who ask questions, who move away from ignorance. But a person needs to know first deep in their heart that I don't know anything. If a person thinks they know everything, then they will never, never succeed. They will be embarrassed every step of the way. So humility is very, very important. 
Humility is part of our tradition. So let me summarize that for you one more time. This is where the story begins. And this verse where Allah says, Ayatul lissa'ilin, there are lessons for all who ask, tells us that one must be a seeker of truth. And that journey begins by asking questions, which in, start, which in turn starts from the realization from within each and every one of us that we are indeed ignorant. And I wrote this at the end, knowledge flowers from the fertile soil of humility. Knowledge flowers from the fertile soil of humility. It's a metaphor. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. This is where you get knowledge from. So this is what happened. The next verse is قَالُوا لَيُوسُفُ وَأَخُوهُ أَحَبُّ إِلَىٰ أَبِيْنَا مِنَّا وَنَحْنُ أُصْبَةً إِنَّ أَبَانَا لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Remember when they said to one another, Surely Yusuf and his brother, which is Binyamin here, are more beloved to our father than we are, even though we're a group of many people. This is fascinating, this verse. Indeed, our father is clearly mistaken. That's what's happening here. Now, let me tell you something. It's natural that we love certain things. Sometimes we love one thing over another. It's a fitri thing. Some people love different types of things. Love is a mystery, as they say. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within us that we love certain things over other things. And sometimes we don't have control over it as well. And I will tell you a story about love, but we don't have time. Love, as they say, is a mystery. So Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam, of course, loved bin Yamin and Yusuf alayhi salatu wasalam quite deeply. There were reasons why he loved them as well, because of where they came from and so forth and so on. The brothers, they look at their numbers and they say, oh, look at us, we're, we're great in number. Why doesn't he love us? Fascinating. Their preference came from numbers. They saw the zahir. They were like, if someone's high in numbers, there's many of us, and surely you should favor us. We're a big number. We're a big number. But they were thinking about material things. They look at the zahir. And they were like, because we're good in numbers, we're, we must be strong. Why doesn't he love us? Because we're strong. But Yaqub and his love for Yusuf and bin Yami is teaching us something much, much more powerful than that. You see this in the story. Because Yaqub preferred beauty. What did he prefer? Beauty over power. Beauty over numbers. Beauty over strength. Strength may lie in numbers, but true strength, my friends, lies in love over numbers. It's not about how many you are. Allah mentioned this in the Quran many, many places. It's not about numbers. It's about your ikhlas and your sincerity and your devotion. So beauty, in the end, is what conquers hearts, not force. You can't force people to do things. They will do it. You will force your children to do something, they will do it. But they're not doing it for the right reasons. They're doing it out of fear. You can do a bayan and scare people. They'll do it out of fear. Or you can try and win their hearts like Yaqub alayhi salatu wasalam. What did he say? Ya bunayya. You want to get to people's hearts. This is the way of the prophets. Ashidda'u ala al-kuffar ruhuma'u baynahum. They were stern towards the disbelievers. But amongst themselves, they were merciful. You'll find many, many places in the Quran Allah says this. So mercy is normative. That's how you're normally meant to behave. Yes, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasalam sometimes became angry. Yes, he did. But it was the exception to the rule. And he only became Angry for Allah's sake, not for His sake, not for His own desire. So we see this in this particular verse. لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي يُوسُفُ وَأَخْوَتِهِ آيَاتُ لِلْسَائِلِينَ And the verse after that, verse number 8, that we learn in there that we should only do things for the pleasure of Allah and it's your beauty of character that wins people. If you're a good person, genuinely good person, you care about people, you show love towards people, you'll win them over. If you force it upon people, like Ibn Khaldun, rahimahullah ta'ala says, if you force people to do things, you actually create a bunch of hypocrites. That's what he says. Because they're not doing it for the right reasons. Why are they doing it? Because Mawlana Harun will shout at me. Or my dad will shout at me. My mom will shout at me. No, what you want to do is to win people over, win their hearts. And I will end, again, going to the point I made at the beginning, to remind us all that our job is to follow the Prophet's way, which is to unite people.